You see, this idea of love God and love others, that's the whole Ten Commandments. That's all the Old Testament law. You want to know what God requires of you to love Him and to love others. To love God and to love others. Now, the only way you're ever going to be able to accomplish that is to get on your face, realize you're a sinner, and say, God, make me born again. I need you. Not me. Not what I did. I need you. I want to begin this morning in Luke chapter 10. If you'll turn over in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10 and find your way to verse 25. And when you find verse 25, I'd ask you to stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Verse 25, it says this, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You may be seated. Isn't that a question? What should I do to inherit eternal life? These are the words that, that all of us probably drew us to God was a thought like this, a question like this about our lives. I remember it very well when I was in middle school. We were, there was this crossroads. They've since got rid of this crossroads now, just here recently. But there was a young boy. His name was Bill. And he and his grandparents were driving down that crossroads and another car jumped out in front of them, hit their truck, turned it over, and they said it was so gruesome an accident that blood literally came forth from the cab after it was done. It was a scary thing. I knew this boy. He was near me. I, I, he walked in the classes that I was in. He was around me. And then he just wasn't anymore. He wasn't here. He was completely gone. And that was the first time I really understood that death is certain. We're all going to die. There's going to be a day when you will not be on this earth anymore. You'll be in the ground. You'll be burned up. But your physical body will not be here any longer. And, and I, I guess... When I finally got to understanding what all of this Christianity was all about, I began to understand that I didn't deserve heaven. You know, there isn't any kind of funeral that goes on anymore where anybody says, well, this guy, he went straight to hell, right? No one says that. No one has any thought that there might be a hell to shun and a heaven to gain, right? No one thinks those things. But I think before you become a Christian, before that you can actually be saved, you have to understand that you've done wrong. You have to come to the knowledge that I am a sinner. Problem is, sometimes after we get saved, we won't put that knowledge in the back pocket, right? I'm not a sinner anymore. Folks, you're just, you're just, you're just made precious by the blood of Christ. Made precious by the blood of Christ. And there's nothing that you can do to deserve it. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. And of all the religious people who would eventually have Jesus killed, they would teach you that you can earn this salvation. That you can gain it by doing a good work, by coming to church, by uh, giving money, by uh, having all sorts of different things about you. They'll tell you that you can gain it, and they believe that you can gain it. Why do they think that they can earn this great salvation? Because they don't see the true sin of their soul. They don't see how dark and bad they truly are. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what Jesus was trying to teach us on the Sermon on the Mount. That you couldn't do enough good because God expects more than just an outward change about you. You have all lusted, maybe recently, you have all lied. You have all come short of the glory of God. And before I just say all, I notice there's three more points back at me. We are all sinners. And we come short of being able to earn that heaven. And when Jesus preached that Sermon on the Mount, I hear people say, well, I live by the Sermon on the Mount. Really? Really? You've never told a lie. You've never done anything wrong. You're always doing everything correct. You've never made a mistake. Really? 
You live by the Sermon on the Mount? I think you think you do, but you don't. You don't. We all come short. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus up there that night when he came to him, he said, ye must be born again. Again. You can't just do it. You've got to be it. You've got to be changed from the inside out to become a new man in Christ. And that's what the question really is about, that you must be born again. It isn't about what's going to happen to me after I die. It's what's going to happen to me now, here. There will be a change in who I am. I will come to life. There are people that you come in contact every day. They're dead in their sins, just wandering around this world. Dead in their sins, not knowing the truth. And folks, check your own self. The Bible says to look at yourself and see if these things be so. Look deeply at yourself. Am I alive or am I just religious? Which one is it? If you're born again, you start a new life from that moment and everything will never be the same again. You can't live out at Sermon on the Mount or do anything as deeply as required as all those Old Testament laws unless you're born again. And this is one of the reasons why people come to church. They come to church for, for several different reasons. Some of them have a question. They have an idea. I'm seeking an answer. What's going to happen after I go through that moment of death? What, what is all this religion? Why do these people all gather in these different buildings all the time? What is this all about? And there are people who come to church genuinely seeking an answer. Then there are people who come to church because it's tradition. It's what they've always done. Mom and Daddy got up, we went to church, and they just continuously, throughout their life, they have just went to church. But here's the thing, folks, they grew into a type of religion. They grew into a type of works-based idea, and they think by coming to church, well, that's just what's required of me. It's not. It's required that you must be born again. You must be made new by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't be that. So there are some people come to church seeking answers. There are some people come to church just continuing their tradition. And there are some people who come to church attempting to disprove what's going on down there. I'm finally going to prove that this Jesus stuff is wrong, right? Uh, go watch the case for Christ. I watched that on Easter Sunday of Lee Strobel. He goes through and he's going to prove to his wife that all of this is just a bunch of baloney. And you know what? He got saved and he's a pastor now. Folks, I pray that you will seek answers. I pray that you will try to figure out what's wrong. But there are some people, like this lawyer here, who came with this vindictive idea that he is going to catch preacher Jesus in a wrong word so he can destroy his favor with the people and get him pushed out of the way so he can have the preeminence, the Jewish leaders can have the preeminence and the power again because they didn't like this old preacher coming in telling them things and it upset them, it disturbed them because they wanted the control of the people. And, and we see that a lot. That's what causes popes to rise up. The pope himself, he rose up. He was just one of the other groups, and he decided that he was going to be bigger than all the rest, and he began telling them, this is how it's going to be. This is how it's going to be. Well, finally, all the eastern churches separated from them, and he went off on his own, and now people come and kiss his ring. And I know that's as unscriptural as can be, right? I don't bow down to a man. I bow down to the God-man. He is the leader, head, leader and the head of the church, isn't he? And so these Jewish leaders, they were against that. They didn't like that. Notice the words here in this. Now, a lawyer means that he was well-versed in the law. It means he knew the Bible. You know that you can know the Bible like the back of your hand and be as lost as can be? You can know every inch of that Bible. You can know every word. You can know how all this fits together over here. You can know how many feet are on the beast that Daniel had. You can know all of that and be as lost as can be and open your eyes in hell one day. You can be that lost. This man, he was well versed in the law of God. But notice what he says here next. He says he tempted him. He was coming trying to test the Lord of glory, trying to see, well, I'm going to catch him in his words. That's what lawyers do, isn't it? They try to catch somebody in their words, try to manipulate the situation, try to put the correct spin on it. That's what happens with that fake news somebody said a minute ago. That's what they do. They try to put a correct spin on it the way they would like it to go. But I think the most telling word in this verse here is what he says when he says inherited. 
inherited. How many of y'all think that because you come to church each Sunday, you've just inherited the kingdom of God. I've heard people tell me that before. Well, I'm just part of the family, and we just always grew up there, so I'm going to heaven just because of that. No other reason, not because you had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but just because it's my inheritance. This is what I'm going to gain, because I uh, have an inheritance in all this. Folks, we have an inheritance, but it was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can't come through mama. You can't come through daddy. You can't come through papa. You've got to come on your own. Your own. It's a personal thing. It's a personal thing. And so you've got to come in that way. This man think that he was owed eternal life. But Jesus loves him, folks. You know, Jesus can love some of the meanest people you've ever seen. He can he can love some of the meanest. He was willing to die for some of the meanest people, including me. Uh, he died for, for people who wouldn't care less about him at the time. What does it say here in verse 26? He said unto him, What is in, written in the law? How readest thou? How much has God revealed to you, my friend? How much has God showed you? Now, there's some people, they only know so much of the Word of God. They only have so much. That's why you've got to be patient with people. You gotta be patient with people because they're, they're growing. Everybody's at a different stage as they grow through what the Word of God says. The thing I want you to notice most about this, Jesus is concerned for this man, even though he's out to get him. You hear that? Have y'all ever got concerned for a co-worker at work who was out to get you? It ain't natural, is it? It ain't natural for you to be concerned about somebody that's literally trying to get you. They're trying to catch you in some kind of a trick or a trial. That's not natural, but folks, that's true sure is Christian. And you know, Christian has Christ in it, right? That's what Jesus is like. That's who Jesus is. And so he tells this man, in loving concern for him, he asks him, you know, you've read the law. How do you read it? What do you see there, my friend? How can I help you? And so he goes on and he reads, 27 through 28, he says, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Now that's what that lawyer said. And Jesus, and he said to them, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. He gave him what he knew at that time. So is Jesus saying that you can save yourselves, that, that you can love God completely, that you can love others completely? Can you do that? No, if he's saying you could do that, you wouldn't have anything to worry about on judgment day, would you, except the fact that you can't. What's the proof of that? In Mark chapter 12, Jesus has a, a, a similar type of uh, discussion with another man. In Mark chapter 12, starting at verse 28, there was a scribe, not a lawyer. This is a scribe. This is a different time. He comes up to him, and, and he heard, the scribe heard these people reasoning together. And the scribe asked, which is the first commandment of all? And this time Jesus answers the question. He says, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Did you hear me? There is none other commandment greater than these two. And the scribe said to him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and is there none other but He? And to love with all thy heart, with all thy understanding, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said to him, Now listen to what he said, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. You're not far from the kingdom of God. You see that it's more than just this outward show of religion, but it's an inward change of heart. It's more than all of this outward stuff. It's more than that. You see that. You're not far from it. You're close. Oh, I, I don't know. Maybe y'all don't go witness, but I go witness sometimes, and, and I get to witness when I'm up here and I'm preaching, and I think, oh, they're right on edge. Oh, I see them back there and they're holding on the side of the pew and they got their hands there and their, their fingers are they're turning white. Ooh, I'd like to just go back there and grab them up, yank them up, bring them up here. You know, I, I just want them to get right with God today. I just want them to see the truth 
about who he is and what he's done. I just want to see things work for God, you know. But I can't do that. Even Jesus didn't do that. He kind of just, you're not far. I feel for him. I feel exactly how he feels sometimes, right? You're not far. Just a little bit closer. You see, this idea of love God and love others, that's the whole Ten Commandments. That's all the Old Testament law. You want to know what God requires of you to love Him and to love others. To love God and to love others. Now, the only way you're ever going to be able to accomplish that is to get on your face, realize you're a sinner, and say, God, make me born again. I need you. Not me. Not what I did. I need you. Love God. Now, some of us have said, well, I love God. I put 10% in the plate. I come to church, I teach a class, I do this, I do that. I stood out in the drive-thru, I've I done these different things. It's more than that. To love God means to always doing things according to His will and not my will. His will. His will be done. Even Jesus wrestled with it. There on the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, He wrestled, Lord, not my will, but Thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. As an example to us to know that when you want to do God's will, sometimes it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to do God's will. It's hard to do what He asks us to do. You know, I think sometimes we get in our minds who God is, and God looks exactly like us. Maybe you've heard of that book, uh, I think it's Jesus Calling, and one individual said that they had read that book, and in that book, this woman, which I, I do not agree with, she goes through and she tries to write words and tries to put uh, words from the Bible in her own words and say, this is Jesus talking. Folks, if you're saying Jesus talking again, you're writing scripture. That ain't happening no more, right? Uh, but, but that's the idea of, of that book. Well, one uh, commentator looked at the book and he, he read over it and he says, Jesus sounds a lot like a middle-aged uh, married woman. Why? Because that was who was writing it down, right? It's, uh, <laughs> that's what we do, isn't it? We turn God into what we want Him to be. Well, if I disagree with that, surely God would disagree with that. If, if, if this is how I feel about it, I know God thinks that way about it. So we take a God and we take the parts that we like out of Scripture that we like about Him, and we throw the things that we don't like out in the background. Well, that really didn't matter anyway. That's not important. I remember the Brady Bunch. How many has ever seen the Brady Bunch before? Anybody seen the Brady Bunch? Good, I'm not as old as I thought. There were some kids raised their hand. The Brady Bunch. Remember the episode where little Bobby, he wanted to be like Billy the Kid? You remember that episode? Uh, he thought Billy the Kid was grand and great and all these different things, but he only knew the things about Billy the Kid that he liked. He didn't know the historical truth that Billy the Kid was a murderer. He was a killer. And, and, and little Bobby had a dream, and he dreamed that Billy the Kid came on a train. He was there with his family, and Billy the Kid went and shot his family. Well, you think things are violent now. <laughs> think about back then. Here's a poor old Bobby seeing his kid uh, shot. But the idea was this. He created Billy the Kid and the idea that he wanted Billy the Kid to be, right? And folks, you and I, we will do that if we don't watch ourselves. We will create God to suit ourselves. We'll make Him in such a way that He'll be exactly what we want. And then the idea is, who's really God, right? Who's God? Now, if Jesus is holy and Jesus is loving... And he probably thinks different than you and I do a lot of times about many different things. Here's the question I want you to ask yourself today. Now listen, who needs to change? Who needs to change? It ain't him, is it? It's us. He is God, and we are his creation. Now the idea of love others, who all does God love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's everybody. It's not just your little group. It's just not the bigger group. It's not just people in America. He says he loves the whole world, right? He loves everyone. So he loves all, and not just a little, a whole lot, because he gave his son up for him, right? Now, do you love the kids that are eating Tide Pods? Now think about that. We look at that and we think, that's crazy. What's wrong with them? How foolish. But God looks at that and he sees somebody so desperate for attention, 
that they're willing to put poison in their mouth so somebody will click on a link so they feel somehow wanted. Now think about that. That's how God sees that. This poor kid that would do something so foolish. Do you love that Muslim person? We can't do that. Well, let's think about this a minute. Let's put ourselves in his shoes a second. Here's a man who has lived his entire life. Maybe he's a Muslim terrorist. He's lived his entire life. He was fed a lie in order for one day for him to go blow himself up on the promise that he's going to go to paradise. In reality, he's going to open his eyes up in hell. Do you love him? Do you have compassion for somebody like that? What if you had grew up in that? What if from your earliest age you were told a bunch of lies and told a bunch of non-truths? You think God loves that person? You think God wants that person to hear the truth? You think that's important to Him? Well, if it's important to Him, shouldn't it be important to you? Yes? Do you love that legalistic person who's attended church all their lives, but obviously they don't know who Jesus is because they don't love their neighbor as thyself? Do you love those? Do you love that person? God does. Says he gave his own son for the whole world. So this man, he hears all of this back in Luke, in verse 29, and then he gets a little convicted. You ever get a little convicted when you you actually even quote the word of God? And in verse 29 he says, But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? You see, that little conviction started up. He wanted to justify this himself. Why? Because this man didn't love everyone. This man only loved those who were his, those who he thought was in his little group. That was the only ones that he cared about, the Jewish people. He didn't care about anybody else, the Samaritans, the other people, the Gentiles outside in the world. He only cared about himself. And so he was going to try to work this out to find out who his neighbor was. Now, now, who does God tell us that we should love? I mean, I gave you John 3, 16. That's one verse, but what about some more? How many are we to love? John 13, 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now, that right there is for believers. We should love other believers. It should be our greatest desire to love those who are of the church. When you come into church on Sunday, you should just feel so much love. You're like, ah, right? I ain't never been loved so much before. I got people that care about me down there. They do anything to help me out. Now, folks, is that what it is? Is that how it's going to be? That's what Jesus said it should be, right? That every individual that is here, that is a believer, we should love. Agape. That means you put yourself aside for them because you love them. You love them. Now that's believers. What about unbelievers? Surely I don't have to worry about those unbelievers, do I? I mean, I can kind of like them. I can share the gospel with them, but then I'm done. I can kick them off the side, right? Well, Romans 13, 8 through 9. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Remember all those laws? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You think God's upset if you go kill an unbeliever? I'd say so, thou shalt not kill. He says all that is bound up in thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That means we have to love everybody. Say, Scott, you mean I have to make a valid choice to love everyone? Yes, yes you do. And you know how you can do that? By being born again. Because a new creature sees things in new ways. He sees the world differently than the rest of this world does because the rest of this world sees things a totally different way than the way the church does. What does a born-again individual look like? Jesus kind of answers that in this, this next little parable that he's about to say to this man. He has a cast of characters in this parable. He has a man. He has thieves. He has two different guys from the church, and he has this one old Samaritan that nobody wanted nowhere near their uh, Jewish religion or their church, you might say. He has all of these people. 
So he begins to answer, and this is what he says. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. You hear that? And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. (laughs) And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, that's not my pence, that was the amount of money they had back then, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now let's look at these people. Now one man said in this cast of characters that Jesus has in this story, this man is kind of representative of all mankind. If you live out in the world very long, you're going to get beat up. Somebody's going to tear you down. Somebody's going to be cruel to you, aren't they? Somebody's going to be mean. There's going to be a fight that occurs with them. And the world is a lot like these old thieves. Their philosophy of life is what you have is mine, right? Isn't that how people think sometimes? What you have is mine. So who's God going to send to help mankind here who have been beaten up by the world? Who will God send to help them? Remember the old show, The Dating Game? I'm on all sorts of TV shows today, ain't it? Remember that old show, The Dating Game, where, where they would set this one person up on the, on the side and there were these three other people and they would question these people to figure out which one of them that they would date or, uh, or something like that, which one is the one that they would choose. And the woman would choose the, descri- choose the one that fit the description of what she wanted by the questions that she asked. Well, you might say Jesus is going to present three here as well and he's going to show the one that would really love him, his bride. You know, in the Bible, Jesus has a bride, doesn't he? You know who his bride is? It's not like some of these crazies say Mary Magdalene. It's the church. The church is the bride of Christ is what the scripture says. One day he'll he'll have his bridegroom. And so he goes through here and he goes through these different people. And first he comes upon this priest who passes by on the other way. Now in, in our modern day we might look at this as a church leader because that's what the priest was back then. He was the religious leader. And he would walk through here. And uh, this religious leader, he would call the shots. He literally controlled the people. Perhaps this priest looked at that man on the side of the road and he thought to himself, well, that lazy welfare dependent, why don't he pull uh, pull himself up by his own straps like me and take care of himself? So he headed off, headed down a different way. Now one reason I think why this man may have traveled by was this. Numbers 19 tells us that if a priest was to touch a dead body, he was not allowed to go back into the temple. He'd be unclean for seven days. So this man was more concerned about doing ministry than helping somebody. He was more concerned about making sure that he was able to go in the temple and light the lights and do the different things than he was about the human being on the side of the road lying there. All of mankind sitting outside of a church dying. And this man sitting here watching him. And he steps by the other side. So he continues what he enjoys to do. His, his, what he thinks is his duty. And he runs off from this other man. Now the Levite's not much different. This might be, in our modern idea, a church worker. Uh, not necessarily a church leader, he might look at this man and say, well, that guy got attacked. I might get attacked if I go over and help. Maybe I should just mind my own business. Folks, there's a time when you've got to step in, right? What do both of these guys are worried about? What are they concerned about? Themselves. Themselves. They're worried about themselves. They're not worried about the other individual. And these two guys represent religion as it always has been. The philosophy of life is what I have is mine. I earned it. I'm owed it. And and in religion, you will see this forever. It's all about just the tradition, my tradition. It's all about the rituals. It's all about the ceremonies. It's all about the legalism. Do you know what legalism is? It's when you start adding on extra rules to what the Word of God said. He said there's two, love God and love others. But you also have to do this and this and this and this and this, right? 
You want to add on everything else. And where do you get those rules from? Yourself, right? What you think somebody else should do. What you imagine it should be. So here are these two. And then comes this old Samaritan. He's that guy they wouldn't even have in the church. They won't have a Samaritan come into that temple. They won't have somebody like that come in or go around. And when this guy heard this, he was probably shocked. Even mankind laying here on the ground. Why in the world would they pick him to come take care of me? And his philosophy of life would be this. What I have belongs to you. What I have is yours if I can help you. Folks, that is Christianity. What I have, I'll give if I can help you out. All I'm concerned about is, is loving God and loving others. Right? Loving God and loving others. It's rather simple, isn't it? But it's far from natural. It ain't natural, is it? It ain't natural to, to, to love somebody else that you put yourself aside. It is natural to do that. But that's what happens to somebody who's been born again. That's what happens. And Jesus was showing here the kind of people that were going to be entered into the church. The Samaritans, the Gentiles, the Jews, all of those who would be born again, new, different, and have a different attitude toward life than all the rest of the world. They would love God and they would love others. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Romans 13, 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Turn over for just a second to Matthew chapter 5. Remember I talked to you about that Sermon on the Mount that so many people say they live by? <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, that's where it begins, and it goes for three chapters, 5, 6, and 7. In that, there's a section where he talks about the Beatitudes. These are the attitudes that should be in a born-again person. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That means they're humble. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now sometimes people say things evil uh, and that's right. <laughs> we have to remind ourselves of that. But if it's for his sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for, for, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. It isn't natural. But Jesus says here back in, back in Luke, who now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that shewed mercy on the, him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Go and do thou likewise. Are you born again? Are you new? Are you changed? Have you been changed by the, the man? from Galilee. The one who came and was always perfect, who fulfilled that whole Sermon on the Mount, who did every one of those commandments. And remember, we only got two. And they were rough, ain't they? Love God and love others. He did that constantly from the moment he was born to the moment he died. And why did he do that? Did he have to do it? No. He did it for you. And you. And you. And you. All of us. He did that for you. And all He wants to do is give you a life. A real life. Not a life like the rest of the world where we're just biting and chewing and kicking and clawing and getting what we want and all worried about power struggles and nonsense like this. But a life that loves others and loves God. And that's when you'll have true life, right? We would love for you to come meet us at one of our regular meetings in person. Sunrise is located directly off exit 23 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee.
We regularly meet Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for small group Bible studies and then at 10.50 a.m. for worship. We also meet Sunday evenings for worship at 6.30 p.m. and Wednesday nights for discipleship training at 6.30 p.m. We would love for your family to meet our family. And again, thank you for watching and sharing with others.